I want to invite you in your Old Testament to 1 Samuel chapter 25, if you'll open there, please. 1 Samuel chapter 25. We're going to look at uh, this text for just a little while this morning. And I imagine that it's a familiar story uh, to a number of you, uh, maybe not to everybody. Um, and we're not going to read the story. I want to describe the story to you. And there's some elements that we'll return to. It's rather lengthy. It takes uh, the entire chapter, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 25. But I want to set it in its context. Uh, David has been anointed by the prophet Samuel as the future king. Saul has been rejected by God. And Saul has not accepted that rejection very well. In fact, what Saul has started to do is to grasp for power. And so he has blamed his rejection on David. He's made David his enemy and so is spending his days chasing David and doing other foolish things in order to try to keep hold of the power as it continues to slip away from him, as he continues to lose credibility with his army, with the people, with all of those really who love him best. Uh, his and Samuel's relationship dissolves because Saul becomes so proud. He's just somebody that nobody can talk to, nobody can reason with. The story in 1 Samuel chapter 25 is sandwiched between two uh, confrontations or two episodes with, that have Saul and David involved in them. Uh, David has two opportunities to take Saul's life, and he doesn't do that. One of those is described in the 24th chapter. One of those is described in chapter 26. And David shows, in fact... A, a, a courageous faith, a very humble spirit in dealing with the man who hates him and the man who is pursuing him and wanting to put him to death. And so the manner in which David deals with Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 24 and 1 Samuel chapter 26 is, is a model of a humble spirit. And one of the things that makes David a man after God's own heart, one of the things that made him a foreshadow of Christ, because he shows that kind of spirit toward one who should have been a friend, but it's a friend who's become his uh, arch enemy and rival. Now, the thing that's unique about 1 Samuel chapter 25 is that in between these Two episodes where David shows such valor and such virtue in the way that he behaves. We find in chapter 25 a place where David loses it for a minute. Uh, he has, he's out in the wilderness. He's being chased by Saul. He has his army with him. And uh, he has been fighting the battles that the king of Israel should be fighting. But the king of Israel's not fighting. The king of Israel's wasting his time chasing David. And so David is the one who's fighting the battles of the Lord. And so he's protecting the Lord's people. He is going out and fighting the Lord's enemies. And uh, he is shown a neighborly kind of kindness for a, a wealthy man who lives in the region of Mount Carmel whose name is Nabal. Uh, we're told in the opening verses there that Nabal is a... He, he, he's, a, he's a very uh, wealthy man again who has a beautiful wife whose name is Abigail. And she's not only beautiful uh, in form and in face, but she's also very beautiful in her, in her character. She is a very virtuous and wise woman as well. And apparently she was really the only thing that Nabal had going for him. Because he was a foolish man and he was a wicked man, even though he was very a wealthy. Well, David sends a, uh, a, a group, uh, a contingency from his uh, army that go to Nabal and ask him for some uh, supplies if he would share with them some food. And apparently it was the season of harvest and sheep shearing and that kind of thing. And so there, there, it should have been a time where there was plenty available. And uh, David, meanwhile, has been protecting his 
Naboth's fields. He's been protecting his flocks. He's been protecting his servants. And so he's hoping that Nabal will show him the same kindness that he and his army have shown to Nabal. Well, the men get there and they present David's case, ask if Nabal will give them some provisions, and Nabal completely blows them off. He completely rebuffs them. He scorns them. He says there's lots of servants that are uh, rebelling against their masters, implying that David has in some way uh, done something that is deserving of the kind of burden that he's under in being pursued by Saul, that he has shown a, a bad spirit toward his master and that he's getting what he deserves. And Nabal makes it very clear that he's not going to do anything to help. So, his soldiers come back to him and they bring him word about what Nabal has just said. And David says, put on your sword. And he puts on his sword. And those are the only words that he speaks to his men, is put on your sword, because he is fixing to go and teach Nabal a lesson. And so David and his, he leaves 200 men with the bags, he takes 400 men with him, and they start on the march to Mount Carmel. And he is going to clean some house when he gets there. Well, uh, the servants of Nabal go to Abigail. And, um, you know, it, this is probably a conversation that has, you know, that happens a lot in this, in this community. Um, and uh, you can imagine Abigail saying, well, what's he done now about her husband? Because they come to Abigail and they tell her that you, you know how your husband is and... This is what's happened. David is in the wilderness. He has been protecting our community. And he has asked Nabal for, uh, for help. And Nabal has played the fool. And now David's men are on the march. And they're coming here. And Abigail wastes no time at all with getting together some provisions. Uh, with getting together some drink and some food. She gets some servants. She, she, she gets everyone started. Says, don't say a word to my husband. Don't say anything to Nabal. And so she personally takes on herself the burden of doing something to resolve the situation. So she sets out and she's got some young men with her who have the provisions. And she tells them to go on ahead of her. And she comes behind. And it's a, it's a very visual picture that's painted for us by uh, the writer of 1 Samuel that uh, David's men, his 400, are on one side of the mountain and they're coming along. And here's Abigail on the other side of the mountain uh, where, and they can't see her and she's making her way. And David vows in his heart that, there, that when he is done with Nabal's house, there's not going to be anybody living when it's all over with. He makes that vow as he's on his way. And then here come uh, the presents from Abigail. And here comes Abigail herself. And when she comes in front of David, she prostrates herself. She falls down on her face. And she makes a speech that completely changes the heart and completely changes the mind of David back to the kind of man that he really is and that he really wants to be. And David repents and he says to Abigail, if God had not sent you, uh, I know what I would have done today. And I know how my vengeance, my own vengeance would have gotten the best of me on this setting. And so he thanks her he takes the provisions that she's offered and he and his army turn away. The attitude that is kind of at the heart of this story that I want us to give some attention to this morning is an attitude that's manifested in Nabal especially, but it's an attitude that gets the better of David too that I want to give, us, I want to give some uh, I want us to give some time to contemplating this morning. And it's the spirit of pride. It's the spirit of pride. It's the thing that infects and inflates Nabal. 
And it's the thing as well that inflates David to behave in a way that is not characteristic of David and is in fact very uh, much different from the spirit that he shows on other occasions. As we've already noted, the spirit that he shows towards Saul right before this story and right after this story, but he loses it in the story that's before us here in 1 Samuel chapter 25. I, I first of all want you to think for a moment about just what pride is. And so I've brought in a, uh, an object lesson in order to make the point. I, I want to give a definition of pride that I hope will stick with you and that will, um, will help, help us contemplate what it is that goes on in our heart when we become caught up with pride. I want to define pride for us this morning as self-inflation. Self-inflation. You see, we all have this balloon inside of us. And what happens when we get proud is that balloon starts to blow up. And so David is out in the wilderness. And he's out in the wilderness because he is fighting God's battles. Battles that Saul should be fighting. And he has come to Nabal's mountain, to Mount Carmel... And he is protecting Nabal's flock and Nabal's family and Nabal's community. And Nabal is not returning the kindness. And here it is that David has sent his men to Nabal in order to ask a favor of him. And Nabal has now rebuffed him, scorned him in front of all of his men. David is a good man. And Nabal, he's a foolish man. You see how that happens? Now, something important for us to think about when it comes to pride is it's not just that we inflate the things that, we, that, that are our virtues. It's not just that we inflate the things that we do well, the gifts that we have, or the righteousness of the purpose that we're about. But, but another element of pride is that we can also inflate our disadvantages, our liabilities, our burdens. And you see how that becomes... I don't know exactly what it was that David was saying to himself, but those are some of the things that David might have been saying to himself. But, but I just want you to see that both of those become inflated in a proud heart. So that we not only talk about how you know, we are fighting the Lord's battles, but we also say things within ourselves like, you know, I'm fighting God's battles, so why am I out here in the wilderness? I mean, why is this happening to me? Um, be, because we can, off, we, can, we can think of pride as being on one end of the spectrum and something like self-pity being on the other end of the spectrum. But I want you to see that pride and self-pity are not so different. Both of them come from being overly impressed with me, with myself, so that I either wallow in or, or e e e exult in the things that are so good about me that I'm celebrating, or I wallow in the things that are my burdens. Nobody hurts like I do. Nobody's going, nobody understands. Um, you, you know, why, why me? And so we, we, we inflate our problems or we inflate our liabilities or our disadvantages the same way that we inflate our advantages or our gifts or our ideas or whatever it is that causes us to swell up with pride. Now, I, I want you to think about a couple other things in terms of what pride does, this self-inflation. And I, I, let me just add to this, I haven't made mention of this, but... That whole picture of pride as a self-inflation is a picture that Paul himself uses in, first, in the book of 1 Corinthians especially. When he talks about some of the problems that exist in the church at Corinth, he talks about how the people have become puffed up. If you look at your King James Version, uh, it'll say arrogant in some of the more recent translations, but a lot of them will have a, a, margin, a, a marginal note that'll say with the word arrogant or proud, 
the, the expression puffed up. 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 4 talks about how love, again in the King James Version, will say love is not puffed up. And other translations will say love is not proud or love is not arrogant, I think it says in the New American Standard Version. And so it's the idea of how pride does that to us. It fills us up or we allow ourselves to be filled up with pride. Think about if all of us have a balloon like this and that balloon gets very big, how many of us can fit in this room? You see the bigger the balloons get? I mean somebody, when, if, if, if there's a culture of pride, somebody's going to get suffocated. Somebody's not going to be able to come into the room because we're going to push them out. And that, that not only happens within a congregation, I mean, it can happen in our own family. We can get, we talk about our kids getting too big for their britches, and that's what we're talking about. We're talking about becoming proud to where that becomes a provocation to other people. Uh, think about when you become puffed up like this, how fragile you really become. I mean, usually we become inflated about our strengths or we become inflated about our liabilities. But I just want you to see how, how vulnerable or fragile we become. It just doesn't take much for you to pop, does it, when you become proud? Because when we become self-inflated, it, it just, it's just, uh, it's just a lot, we're just a lot harder to get along with when that becomes the case. Now, I don't know what Nabal's excuse was. I don't know how he got so blown up the way that he did, or puffed up with his pride. But we can see how it was that that became... I didn't think about this part, about how to get the air out. But, but it, it makes the point. I mean, we got to get empty, right? And, and, and that's, where, that's where pride gets the best of us. Uh, so pride is this whole matter of self-inflation. A couple things I want you to note about how it works in the text here. Pride is communicable. It's an infection that is contagious. Uh, think about how it started in David. He is provoked. Uh, it, 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 he, he has a righteous purpose that he's about when this story begins, but the pride of Nabal becomes provocative to him. And, and I, I just want you to see how contagious it, be, it, it can become. It can happen in your family. You... Uh, have a proud response. And what does, it, what does it do to the rest of the family? Your, your kids are incited by your pride. Your wife is affected by it. She's provoked by it. And so it can become a contagious kind of thing the same way that it becomes contagious to David. A man after God's own heart becomes affected by the pride of someone else. He becomes provoked by that. A, a second thing that I want you to notice about, uh, about pride in the text here that makes it so dangerous, and that is that it can, inf it, can, uh, in it can infect virtuous pursuits. It can infect virtuous pursuits. Look at, look at what David is asked for when he goes up to greet, when he gre goes up to greet Nabal. Verse 5 says, So David sent ten young men, and David said to the young men, Go up to Carmel, visit Nabal, greet him in my name, and thus you shall say, Have a long life. Peace be to you, and peace be to your house, and peace be to all that you have. I mean, this starts off so kind and so virtuous. Peace is what David is after. And he says in verse 7, And now I have heard that you, are, you have shears. Now your, your shepherds have been with us, and we have not insulted them. That's good, isn't it? That's virtuous. And they have not missed anything. All the days that they were in Carmel, ask your young men and they will tell you. Therefore, let my young men find favor in your eyes. David's uh, his request here is very selfless. He's not wanting anything that's, uh, that's undeserved. And he's not even wanting something for himself. He's wanting something for his men. And so he says, Let my young men find favor in your eyes, for we have come on a festive day. Please give whatever you find at hand. So he's not even asking for anything lavish. Just whatever you can spare. Whatever you find at hand to your servants and to your son, David. David starts off very humble. But it changes. And so what starts as a virtuous cause and a righteous purpose becomes infected with pride, so it turns into something else. Something that is not selfless, 
something in fact that becomes very uh, something that becomes very uh, selfish. I want you to see that I can be proud and I can do the right thing, but I can do the right thing with the wrong motive. Uh, I can be proud and say the right words, but say the right words with the wrong kind of heart. Um, or my pride can cause me to even pursue something that is God's purpose, but that purpose becomes hijacked, and rather it being about God's purpose, it becomes a personal crusade. And that's exactly what's happened to David here, is that now this has become for him a personal crusade. Look at how he speaks in verses 21 and 22, in that scene where he's coming round the mountain, and Abigail's on the other side of the mountain, and David says, surely in vain, listen, listen to the me talk in this, the inflation. Surely in vain I have guarded all that this man has in the wilderness so that nothing uh, was missed of all that belonged to him. And he has returned me evil for good. May God do so. Now look how he's getting God involved in his speech here. But it's really me talk. May God do so to the enemies of David and more also, if by morning I leave as much as one male of any who belong to him. It's now become David's personal crusade rather than just being about feeding his men. It's become something different. Now, that's the thing that's so slippery about pride is how blinding it can become when my heart is inflated, where I am thinking me and where I'm talking me and where it becomes about my advantages or where it becomes about my disadvantages is how, uh, is, is how pride uh, 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 blinds us. And, and the deceptive thing about that is that it can feel right and be wrong. Because I expect that David feels, on this occasion, very much full of righteous indignation. This is a man who has wronged God's purpose. Here's a man who has wronged God's people. Here's a man who's from the tribe of Caleb, but he's not acting like a Caleb. And David is going to go teach him a lesson. And so his pride has blinded him. The point I want us to see about pride in all of this is that pride is always wrong. It doesn't matter who the object of it is. It's always wrong. It's always the wrong way to behave. It's the bane of families. It's the bane of leadership. It's the bane of communities when we become infected with pride. It's just always wrong. I think of when Moses had the people in the wilderness and they were complaining once again about how thirsty they were. And so Moses goes and God tells him to go and to speak to the rock so that water comes forth from it. And it was, the, it was pride that got the better of Moses when he stood before, before the people and when he was so angry with the burden that they caused him that he smote the rock out of anger and water came forth. And his speech on that occasion was all about him. Uh, about how what, we, what he had to do in order to, to give them drink in the wilderness. And so it, he just became, he lost himself and became self-inflated. And that's exactly the same thing that David is going through uh, right here on this occasion. And it it hurt him. If there, is, if there is anything that I find myself wrestling with every day, it's this whole problem of pride. Uh, Jen and I are right, driving down the road, and uh, she says, um, you need to be in the other lane. And so I get, I shift over in the other lane, and we come to um, get off the interstate, and uh, you need to be in the, the other lane for when we make the turn, because then when we get to the next turn that we're going to make, you'll already be in that, that lane. Well, that betrays a difference in kind of like what happens when I'm driving and when she's driving. Um, I don't think about driving when I'm driving. 
Uh, I think about other stuff. My drive time is my thinking time, which doesn't make for a very good driver. Uh, and certainly not a very good navigator at all. And, and, and Jennifer, when she is driving, she pays attention to everything. She sees every landmark. She pays attention to what else. She's the most defensive driver that, 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 I, that I know. And she's really a great driver. So she pays attention to where other people are. She pays attention to what lane you need to be in when you come to different intersections. And, and she's, she's great at that. But I, I tell you what happens sometimes in those conversations is my balloon starts getting pretty big. <laughs> and and the, the car gets a little cramped when the balloon gets big. And, and the, the thing is, is that that not only has, that, that doesn't just stay in the car. Um, it, it gets carried into the house. And so it, 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 it ends up becoming a part of breakfast. And it ends up becoming a part of you know, the conversation later, later on in the day. I carry, I carry the balloon to work and it's already big and then something else happens and then it just gets, it gets bigger. Um, and, and, and because that's just, that's, just the way, that's just the way pride is. It's the way it, it works in our, in our hearts. Uh, uh, Ralph sent me a message this week. And uh, it came on a day when there was a lot going on, and it came near the end of the day. And uh, I was provoked. My balloon got big. And it was a little thing. Uh, Ralph asked a question about our Wednesday night class, and he was asking me if I was going to use the book in our class. Well. He didn't, he didn't say anything about suggesting that I ought to use the book in the Wednesday night class. He just asked the question if I was. Well, I mean, I know Ralph, and so I knew what he was getting at. <laughs> and so that's the first puff of air. Um, and so I think, well, do I just, you know, not respond? Because I because I know where the conversation is going to go. Or do I, uh, do I just respond curtly and say no? Do I tell him what I think about his book? You know, you, you know how you, your heart goes in all those situations? And so the balloon starts getting big. And so I give Ralph a response that's measured and thoughtful but it's got a lot of balloon in it. I mean, there's a lot of air in the response that I give. Well, short story is, my class on Wednesday night has not been going very well. I mean, it's not been very good. And I've been, I've been unhappy with the way that I've conducted the class. And uh, so, I use the book Wednesday night. And I, there was a part of me that wanted it to go really, really bad. <laughs> and you know what? It went really, really well. It went really well. And it made me think about how vulnerable we are as a people to just the whole, um, to selling out to pride. I mean, we, I, want, I want to be a part of a congregation where people can talk to me about things that aren't working so well and to be able to hear that and to be able to respond to that and to be able to work together on how can we make something better. But if I've got this big balloon in my heart, how is that going to go for us? I mean, how is that going to work? It's not going to work very well, is it? If, if, if there's easy provocation, if there's a lot of pride that's, that's, living, that's living inside me. And so there's got to be an attentiveness on all of our part to just the propensity to that and how that can hurt our family, how it can hurt our leadership in the family, 
how it can hurt our relationships with each other, how we can carry that to work, how it can hurt our efforts to reach out to people in our community if we're infected with, with, with pride, um, how it can just destroy the good things that God can do through us when our hearts are inflated that way. I don't like criticism. I don't like it. I don't enjoy it. And I, don't, I, can't, entertain, I can't entertain the possibility that next week I'm going to feel different about that, that I'm really going to be glad when someone confronts me about something. But now I understand it and I appreciate the value of it. But you see, it's the knee-jerk response to not liking that, not wanting that, that becomes a trigger for pride. And so one of the things that I've got, I don't know what it is about this story that made David blow up when he wouldn't blow up with Saul. But, but there was something about it that made that whole situation a trigger for him. And so I've got to be conscious about where my pride is peaked, where it, what it is that, that blows it up so that, I can, so that I can deal with that. You need to know that too about me be, be, in order to confront me about that, right? And so there needs to be that kind of acknowledgement of those areas where we have a pride problem so that we can be more... Um, we can be better at how it is that we confront that and how it is that we handle that in our relationships. Okay, just a couple things before we, we close. A number, in terms of solutions, I mean, what do I do about the problem of pride? What do I do about pride in me and what do I do about pride in others? The, the first thing that I want you to see about how I confront pride in others is the lesson that Abigail teaches us. How do you confront pride? And the, and the solution is very simple. Be humble. <laughs> That's how you confront pride. Be humble. Look at how Abigail confronts David. Verse 18. Then Abigail hurried uh, uh, and, and, and took 200 loaves of bread and two, two jugs of wine and five sheep already prepared and five measures of, of roasted grain and hundreds, uh, 100 clusters of raisins and 200 cakes of figs and loaded them on donkeys. And she said to her young men, Go on before me. Behold, I'm coming after you. I just want you to see that the humility in, in Abigail taking this on herself. She's taking it on herself. This is not... She didn't cause this, this problem. But she is taking it on herself to be, a, to be the solution to it. So I just want you to see the humility in that, that she takes on this burden to confront the problem. And so she, she does this, and she does it in a servant way. Then, then I want you to see in verse 23, when Abigail saw David, she hurried and dismounted from her donkey, and she fell on her face before David and bowed herself to the ground. She is humble. She fell at his feet, and she said... Listen, on me alone, my Lord, be the blame. And please let your maidservant speak to you and listen to the words of your maidservant. On me alone be the burden. It all started with Nabal, but she says it's, it's all on me. She could have said, you stubborn men, <laughs> you know, I got to step in here and fix all... She doesn't do that. She says, on me alone be, uh, be the blame. Please let your maidservant speak to you and listen to the words of your maidservant. Please do not let my Lord pay attention to this worthless man, Nabal, for as is his name, so is he. Nabal is his name and folly is with him. But I, your maidservant, did not see the young men of my Lord whom you sent. And so she goes on to describe uh, what she is trying to do in order to resolve this. But I want you to see she, she confronts David about his wrong. But she does it in a way that's very humble she says in verse 28, Please forgive the transgression of your maidservant, for the Lord will certainly make for my Lord an enduring house, because my Lord is fighting the battles of the Lord. She acknowledges what David is doing, and evil shall not be found in, in you all your days. And should anyone rise up to pursue you and seek your life, then the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living with the Lord your God. But the lives of your enemies he will sling out as from the hollow of a sling. And it shall come about, listen how she does this, it shall come about 
that when the Lord shall do for my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you and shall anoint you ruler over Israel, that this will not cause grief or a troubled heart to my Lord, both by having shed blood without cause and by my Lord having avenged himself. So she saves that to the end and says, David, this is not, this is not about the Lord. This is about you taking vengeance on your enemy. And uh, David feels the sting of that. And he repents of what it is that he's done. Now, that is not our knee-jerk response. When we, that's not my knee-jerk response when I see pride in someone else. What I want to do is I want to help humble them, don't you? I mean, that, that's the way that... that, that that's, that's our knee-jerk response to pride. And it's not, that's not the way that you confront pride. When Jesus was confronted by the proudest being in all the cosmos, the devil, he emptied himself. He fasted. He was humble in his answers. And, and I've got to learn the power of humility in confronting pride. Now, a Abigail not only does that with David, she actually does it with her husband. When she gets back, she tells him what she did. And there's a risk that's involved in our being humble with each other. And the risk is this, that if I'm humble, then I might get hurt. If I'm humble, then, then, then I don't know what the result is. And that's the faith part of humility, is that I need to trust, we need to trust when we're being humble, that we are, we are putting the outcome in the hands of the Lord. That, that, that's, the, that's the risk part of that is that we are yielding control over the situation that we're going we're gonna to leave the outcome to God. And so Abigail, she goes, she has no weapons. All she has is gifts. She's only armed with humility and she goes and she confronts David. And Abigail, a lone woman, does something that no army ever did all the days of David's life. She stopped him in his tracks. Now that's how powerful humility is. She did what Saul could not do, what the giant could not do, what the Philistines could not do, what no army ever did. She stops him, and she does it only armed with humility. She goes with her, to her husband, and she confronts him in the same humble way. And his heart stopped when he was confronted with the truth of that. And ten days later, he dies. And I don't know if he had the power within him, if he would have done something to Abigail, but the Lord took care of that because she entrusted the outcome to God. And so I've got to trust in being and in, in, in responding humbly and in maintaining humility in all my relationships. I, I, I'm trusting the outcome of all of that because I don't always know what the outcome is going to be, but I'm trusting that outcome to God. And that makes for a better way. Let me, say, let me say just three things about how we confront humility or how we confront pride in ourselves. Number one, uh, we've got to exalt God. Look at how David does that. Verse 32, Then David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, who sent you this day to meet me. Um, the way that I practice humility, the way that I confront pride, is I need to elevate God in my life. And that helps to empty the balloon. If I exalt him, David exalts God. Number two, we not only learn to exalt God, but we also learn to prefer others. Look at the way that David speaks to Abigail. He says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, verse 33, and blessed be your discernment, and blessed be you who have kept me this day from bloodshed and from avenging myself by my own hand. And so he... He also shows preference to her. He acknowledges the good that she's done for him in the, way that she's, in the way that she's confronted him. And so he shows preference. Uh, he shows preference in that way. Number three, we not only exalt God and we prefer others, and that lets air out of the balloon, but we empty ourselves. And David does that. He empties himself by confessing his fault. He says... Um, 
that I, he, would, he would have been guilty of bloodshed and that he was going to avenge himself. He admits the wrong that was a part of that. Uh, he accepts her service. Uh, it, it says in verse 35, So David received from her hand what she had brought him. If we are proud, th then we don't accept from each other the benefit that one another can give. I need Ralph's feedback about what I do in my teaching. I need his feedback about what I do in my people things. Because Ralph's intuitive about people. And so I need to hear what he says about observing our culture. And I need to do that with each of you. And so if there's not that kind of willingness to accept the service of others, look at how weak we become if we have to find the strength to do the things that we need to do all within ourselves. That, that leaves us not very strong if it all depends on us. And so we need to accept the service of others. And then number three, we need to listen. So it says in verse 35, David says to her, Go up to your house in peace. See, I have listened to you and granted your request. One of the things that's said about Nabal earlier in the story when the servants go to Abigail and they talk to her is they say, you know Nabal. He won't listen to anybody. He won't listen. And one of the ways that pride can affect us most is in our unwillingness to hear others, our un unwillingness to listen. And so one of the ways that we get empty is, is by doing that, by listening. And not just listening to ourselves, but listening to what others have to say. God help us to be a people where humility is our way, where we are aware of our own tendency to pride, and where we are vigilant about not letting that happen. God make it that way in our home. And God make it that way among us. Because th th that's the way that we become the most useful to Him as a people is if we root out, is if we are aware of that tendency in ourselves and protect our heart uh, against that. Does that make sense? And so the story of David and Abigail and uh, Nabal becomes a really important story about the kind of spirit and the kind of heart that we as a people uh, need, to, need to really be vigilant about preserving uh, in, our, in our family here. So God help us to that end. Uh, where are you in your walk with the Lord this morning? Uh, where, where's your heart? Are you ready to humble yourself before God and to invite His leadership, to invite His reign in your life? Uh, there is no better way than that. And you can, you can entrust every outcome in your life to Him when you let all the air out of your own heart and of your own pride. And when you come to Him for His salvation and for His redemption and for His cleansing, for all the things that you can't do for yourself. Won't you come to Him this morning? Won't you let us help you with that? It's together we stand and as we sing.